Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Know the Faith, Defend the Faith. My name is William Hemsworth. It's great to be with you all again for today's episode. My guest at this time is Mike Aquilina. He's a Catholic author, speaker, poet, and songwriter who serves as the executive vice president of the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology. He is a contributing editor to Angelus News, and his podcast, Way of the Fathers, drops twice monthly at catholicculture.org. Aquilina, he's the, he's the author and editor of more than 60 books, including The Fathers of the Church, the Mass of the Early Christians and Angels of God. Uh, Mike, how are you doing today? I'm doing fine. I'm doing fine. How are you? You know, I'm doing really well. I'm really excited to talk to you. That book, The Fathers of the Church, I picked that up while I was at a seminary at Liberty University mm. when I was studying the church fathers, trying to prove they weren't Catholic. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm excited to talk to you about um, History's Queen. I'm real excited to talk about that book. So I guess the book has been released for a while. It came out in September. I guess, what was the inspiration to write it, and why was that the right time? I'm a history buff, and I'm also someone who's who's uh, who's who's deeply devoted to the Blessed Mother. Uh, I, I grew up with that. Uh, my mother was intensely devoted to her. Uh, my mother. Uh, was always kind of doing her thing, uh, cleaning behind the radiators, holding a rosary in, in whatever hand she didn't have the duster in, you know, and trying to get through a rosary in the course of her day. Um, so I, I grew up, I grew up around Marian piety, and uh, and this is how a history buff expresses Marian piety by seeing how the Blessed Mother works in history. There's a variety of ways, just as there's a variety of ways we see her working in the Bible, in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. Um, she has a presence in both testaments. So I wanted to trace that through history, and uh, and this is the book that came of came of my my efforts. Okay. Great. In the introduction, you talked about when Christians tell their story, that's where Mary is. Mm -hmm. can, can you elaborate on that for us? Hmm. I, I think that Marian devotion has always been a component of Christian piety. It's been that way from the beginning, from the time of the New Testament. Uh, she's there. I mean, the evidence of that piety is there in the Gospels themselves. You know, the first Gospel, St. Matthew's Gospel, begins with the story of our Lord's conception and birth. And she's integral to that story. Uh, it's told in greater detail in St. Luke's Gospel. And in that gospel, she has this enormous speaking part. Um, so, so we see we see the the role she played in Matthew's gospel. We find her uh, as 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 um, as the person who mediates the Messiah's presence to the Gentiles, right? So, so she's the one who greet the greets the Magi and shows them the Messiah. And in that moment, we find that the moment of sal salvation uh, coming to the earth. That's that's supremely important. In Saint Luke's Gospel, we find that she plays a, 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 a more front and center role at the beginning. Uh, as I said, the the speaking parts are longer, and uh, and we find out a little bit more about our Lord's childhood. Uh, up to the age of 12 in that gospel. Uh, uh, in St. John's gospel, uh, she has a very different part to play. And we find her at the beginning of his ministry, kind of pushing it forward. Uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a remarkable scene. It's the story of the wedding feast at Cana. Yeah. And, and she just presents the facts of this problem. They have no wine, right? She presents those to her son and he says, you know, what's that to you and me? My, my hour has not yet come, woman, <laughs> right? And, uh, and, and, and yet he advances his hour for the sake of the woman. He does this for her sake, out of love for her. And I think there, we're supposed to learn about her intercessory power. St. John places that at the beginning of our Lord's public ministry okay. as, as the event that, that launched his public ministry. And then at the end of his public ministry, we find him on the cross giving her, giving Mary as mother to the beloved disciple. Behold your mother. Woman, behold your son. And, and it's a beautiful moment because in that moment, he's giving his mother as mother to us all, to all of us beloved disciples. That's the way the early church fathers interpreted that scene. So we have this, um, this, the, the, these beautiful clues in the gospel 
uh, to, to the, the early Christian's piety. And it continues in the Acts of the Apostles, where we find her in the midst of the church with the disciples as they're waiting in the upper room for the Spirit to come. And St. Luke is doing this uh, in an intentional conscious parallel to the beginning of his other gospel, where she awaits uh, the, the outpouring of the Spirit on her, you know, when she conceives our Lord. Same kind of thing is happening there at the beginning of the Acts of the Apostles. And then in St. Paul's letter to the Galatians, in his summary of the gospel in chapter four, uh, uh, you know, he cannot tell the gospel. He can't tell the good news. He can't tell the story of salvation history without, without mentioning her. And we get to the book of Revelation, and there she is again. You know, she's in the, the center of it as the queen of heaven, this, this woman in heaven, you know, giving birth to the male child who will rule all nations. That could only be one person, Jesus Christ. So this is the mother of our Lord, and it mentions her other offspring, whom we are. So Mary and piety is there throughout the New Testament, and it continues in the time of the early church fathers. The, the Marian piety of the early fathers is consistent with what we find in the New Testament and consistent with what we still practice today. Mm -hmm. It's more developed now, but it's consistent with the earliest records of the Christian church. And that leads me to my next question, because in chapter two, you say that Mary is the mother of the fathers. Can you give us a, a couple of, of examples on how that may play out in the early church? Well, you find her mentioned, again, in St. Ignatius of, of Antioch, okay? He's writing in 107 AD, 107 AD, and he's an old man. He's someone who had had contact with the, with the apostles themselves, had been discipled by them, and he's someone who was so true to the Christian faith that he was willing to die as a martyr. And his seven letters, his seven authentic letters were, were treasured by the early church as, as, uh, as, as these uh, founding documents, really of 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 the the post apostolic age so uh so you have ignatius of antioch and he mentions her and um and and uh, he mentions the mystery of the conception of her conception of our lord and her birth uh and how this was hidden for the devil from the devil it was hidden from the devil uh uh so so it's it's even given this um this strange uh and uh unique really place in in the drama of salvation and uh and I, I, you know I, I i i think a lot about that phrase that this was something hidden from the evil one uh that that it's almost like he he was blinded and he couldn't see uh because of the the bright light he couldn't see what was happening here he he, he couldn't understand what he was uh, perceiving in that moment so anyway even an antel an angelic intelligence was um was 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 helpless in these matters. Uh, uh, but, but again, Ignatius is writing in 107 AD, and he's not the first on the scene to do this. In 70 AD, we find uh, a document in Christian Egypt. It's called, it's called the Ascension of Isaiah. And that document deals in a, in a big way, in a detailed way, with uh, the, the miraculous conception and birth of our Lord. And it really is there to defend Our Lady's virginity, because this was one of the two doctrines that were most fiercely attacked by both pagans and Jews at the time of the early church. And we find that this would continue for the first several hundred years, mm -hmm. that when the enemies of Christianity wanted to attack they would attack the virginal conception of our Lord because it seemed to them improbable and it seemed something they should mock. Um, and the other thing was the bodily resurrection of our Lord. So these two came under attack. These two were most often defended by the apologists of the church. Uh, the, uh, the Ascension of Isaiah, again, was probably written uh, before 70 AD. Uh, we find other documents coming up in the first half of the 100s, uh, Justin Martyr taking up uh, the, the, the story and telling, and, and telling of Mary as the new Eve and, and of her role in salvation history. We find Irenaeus a little bit later talking yeah. about the same themes and talking about her as the, the, the new Eve and the undoer of knots. Uh, he says that Mary, um, Mary, uh, undid the knot that Eve made by her disobedience. Uh, and then Tertullian, again, in the 100s, talking about the role that Mary played and showing this deep veneration of her, this deep respect that was unique uh, in, in, in the church at that time. Okay. 
In chapter three, um, you describe the great devotion that John of Damascus had for Mary. Mm -hmm. Go into that in depth. And how did he defend her title as mother of God and defend the use of images during his time? Well, John, John really laid his life on the line for, uh, for these things, but, but he played a pivotal role. Um, he was really the last of the fathers, and he was the first of the medievals. He was, he was trying to get the teachings of the fathers and, and synthesize, synthesize them. By then, the church had dealt very effectively with many of the heresies about the person and nature of our Lord. Mm. And uh, Mary was involved in all of these questions uh, because, because she played that role in his life. Uh, she was seen by the fathers as the guarantor of our Lord's humanity because he had a human birth from Mary. But she was also seen as the guarantor of his divinity because she was the one um, who could tell the story. She was the one who could say that he was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and not by ordinary means. She was the only one who knew that. And so she was the one who took that forward. Mary was the, the great guarantor and, uh, and kind of the key to all Christology. Uh, this became very evident at the time of the Council of Ephesus. But by the time we get to, um, to John of Damascus in the eighth century, he's trying to synthesize all of this development and answer um, all of the possible objections people would have uh, to the doctrine of, of our Lord's uh, of our Lord's um, person and nature, and uh, and of course Mary's integral to all those questions. Uh, it was a dangerous time to be doing what John was doing uh, because because it was. Um, it was a time when heretics were running the empire and they were averse to religious images and they were having the images of the Blessed Virgin destroyed in many places. There was a, a great one that was very popular. Um, they were tr and, and the first order uh, in, the, in the purge of images was to take down that image. And there was such a riot that the people who were assigned to take down the image uh, were killed in the course of the riot. Uh, wow. th this happened all through the Eastern Empire and it wasn't, um, it wasn't a pretty episode in history and it lasted a long time, you know, almost a hundred years of back and forth um, uh, between, between iconoclasts who wanted to destroy images and iconoduls who wanted to keep to the traditional uh, reverence for images that the church had, had always observed. Hey, Doc. When I was reading the chapter on the plague that was going through Europe, um, you give some pretty chilling stats. I think sometimes we forget about, but what did Mary mean to those people during that time during the plague? Well, this is something that we see at every stage of history that the, yeah. the, the, the Christian people uh, come to express their love for Mary and her maternal role in their lives in different ways. Okay. And at a time like this, uh, many people were grieving. Okay. It, it you yeah. know, there, there were places uh, in Europe where entire villages were wiped out. Everyone was wiped out. There were monasteries where all the monks were gone. They were killed by the plague. And, and the estimates vary, but it's quite likely that that's, you know, up to 70% of the people who were living in Europe at that time were killed by the plague. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a frightful thought. You think about your block where you live right now, mm -hmm. think about 70% of the people gone in just a couple of weeks. Everyone, you know, the important people in your life just gone. So there was a lot of grief at that time. And uh, the church came to fixate on Mary in a much different way. Uh, people, people went to see her as, um, as the woman of sorrows. Okay, so we see this shift in religious images from Mary enjoying heavenly glory because of her role, uh, you know, like the, the woman in Revelation had been the earlier model for much Marian uh, devotion and Marian images. But at this time, we see the emergence of the Pieta, this, this, uh, this type in, uh, in, in religious painting and in religious sculpture. Of course, Michelangelo later on did the, the most famous instance of that, that type, the Pieta that today is in St. Peter's Basilica. Uh, but, uh, but in the Middle Ages, you'll find a proliferation of these images of Mary holding the body of her dead son and grieving. And people could look at her as a model of grief 
and as someone who was sharing their grief at that moment and who wanted to be there with them and to be there for them. It's the same Mary who was there at the beginning of the Gospel of John. Um, she wants to intercede for her children. She wants to be there for the beloved disciples, and this is how she was there for them at that time. Okay. Yeah, just one of the stats I remember you writing was someone could be fine in the morning, dead by nighttime. Like, yes. What can we think about that today? It's, it's insane. Yes, so. because yeah, <laughs> it was a different world in terms of what was possible in medical care, disease right. prevention, the understanding of microbes. It, it was, it was so different from what we have today. Now, since I'm in Arizona, I can't, I can't not ask you about Our Lady of Guadalupe. <laughs> mm, yeah, yeah. And in, in chapter eight, you talk about Our Lady of Guadalupe, the tilma of St. Juan Diego. How did Mary, how did Mary help convert the people during her time during this whole scenario? Well, you think about the context of, of this, right? Uh, it, it comes right after the Protestant Reformation yeah. when, when, when hundreds of thousands and perhaps millions of people had left the church at this point. It was a rather sudden uh, um, catastrophe that the church was enduring at this time. And, um, and then the new world is discovered. And of course, we want to evangelize all the peoples of the world. Well, the, the, the conquistadors didn't always go about the work of evangelization in the best way. Yeah. Uh, uh, they, uh, they, 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 could be, they could be brutal. They could, they could uh, be exploitative. And uh, they did have missionaries with them and the missionaries tried their best. But neither the conquistadors with their force of arms nor the missionaries with their, with their charity could really accomplish much. Uh, they, they really did not make a lot of headway in terms of um, converting people to Jesus Christ. And then what happens? One of those uh, very early uh, native uh, converts, Juan Diego, has a vision of, uh, of Our Lady in 1531, and, uh, and he's not a likely uh, mouthpiece for the cause, right? He's, he's not an educated person. He's not a wealthy person. He doesn't, he's not someone who has, has access uh, to the seats of power at that time. And yet he takes the word forward and suddenly, you know, before you know it, millions of people who seemed so resistant to the Christian faith were converted, really uh, making up. Uh, for uh, for the people had been lost in, um, in in Europe at the time of the Reformation. So Our Lady of Guadalupe really was just an astonishing event that doesn't get enough credit in world history. Uh, it's it's something that was world changing, but something that Protestant America uh, really chooses to ignore, and secular America chooses to ignore. It's a key moment in the history of of uh, of, of of peoples on Earth. Right. Now, since we're talking about history's queen, how does Mary act today in, in today's day and age for us and for the world? Well, uh, I'm looking at my shelf there because I end the book with, um, with an image that I actually have in my office. And it's, uh, it's something that was sent to me years ago, decades ago, by someone who had read, uh, read a piece I had written. And it's an, it's an image of... Uh, the image of the Blessed Virgin painted on a peepal leaf, and it's a, uh, it's it, it came to me from India, and she's painted, and her her baby is painted with Indian features, and uh, and it's it's gorgeous, it's it's a it's a beautiful beautiful image of Our Lady and her Divine Son, uh, and uh, and I treasure it. What the image says to me is that just as Mary has been active and involved in the lives of her beloved disciples, beloved children, down through the centuries, she's still active today. And, uh, and the church still very naturally expresses uh, devotion to her in these traditional ways. Uh, we, we, we render images of her as one of our own, as, uh, as near to us, as like us, as part of the family. She's our mother because our Lord insisted on giving her to us that way. As a mother, behold your mother. We beloved disciples still hear that today. She's still acting in kind of the grand scheme of history, but she's still acting in everyone's personal history. All these anonymous people, I have no idea who painted her image on this leaf in India that I treasure right now, but it's a beautiful work of art, I believe, 
and it's something that um, that gives me that gives me hope and strengthens my faith. Like I said at the top of the show, the book the book came out in September. What feedback have you received from readers about the book? Oh, it's been wonderful. It's been wonderful. Uh, I, coincidentally, or not so coincidentally, I wrote a book about St. Joseph uh, yeah. right afterwards, St. Joseph and his world. And the two books really have gone together nicely as historical studies of these two figures who don't get enough attention and don't get enough study in our, in our culture. Uh, so the feedback has been very good. People are enjoying them. Sales have been good, and that's a good thing too. Um, uh, but but they're, um, they're both books that I enjoyed writing. When I was writing the Mary book, I prayed intensely to St. Joseph for help in my research. When I was writing the Joseph book, I went to, to Mary and begged oh, her wow. for help as I was doing it. And what I learned through this process is that they are still crazy in love with one another and willing to help someone like me to give honor to each spouse in, in, uh, in due season. That's great. So, so what do you, what have you been up to? I mean, it seems like you're coming out with a book every couple months. And I, re, um, I remember a Facebook post that you had, you said, this is how the work gets done. And there's a picture of you at the computer and kids climbing all over your back. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that was perfect. I loved it. But I, I believe you're coming out. One is just in um, pre-sale right now, if I remember correctly. It just came out today. It's called friendship and the fathers. Okay. Right. How the early church evangelized. And it's uh, it's stories from the fathers of the church and some of the texts from the fathers of the church and uh, d- uh, relating what they um, what they thought of friendship and what's the role of friendship in the evangelization of the world. It was the key element, the uh, critical dimension of the first evangelization of the world. And I think it's still uh, serves the same purpose today, that, that this is the, the, the primary way that evangelization happens through friendship. Oh, absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Well, Micah, thanks for your time. Thank you for your time today. Where can our listeners uh, check out your books or learn more about you if they, they wanted to get a hold of you or anything? Well, the best place to find my books is at catholicbooksdirect.com, catholicbooksdirect.com. Uh, that's a family-run business. It's my son's business. Oh, and he, um, he's, he's, he's really good at keeping all my books together and uh, bringing them out there for people and offering them at the best price. Uh, 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 for my other work, you can find me at fathersofthechurch.com. Great. Well, again, thank you, thank you for your time today. And the book we've been talking about is History's Queen. I highly recommend it. A lot of stuff in there I had no idea about. So uh, thanks for joining me today and I really appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me.